Hey, Keepers, what do you say, what do you know? This is a keeper coming at you from my garage, man. And this is my uh, live rig. And, uh, but uh, I've got a, a nostalgic video that we're going to do today. And first of all, I was going through some boxes and I found a couple things. And, um, well, put it this way. I'm seven, wait, I'm seven, I'm 66 years old. And uh, I started playing professionally when I was 12. And um, so I've been around music all my life and everything. I have two older brothers here also, professional musicians, and I come from a musical family. So even though I'm 66, my music equivalent would probably be about 76 years old because I started playing so early. But anyway, I um, was going through some boxes and I came across this. Um, let's see, let me unwrap it here. I can't believe I still have this. And I bought this brand new in 1972, all right? And this is a uh, graphic equalizer made by Electro Harmonics, all right? And I bought this, and then the Electro Harmonics had a thing called, a, uh, I think, a polyphase, which is the same... It was basically the same chassis with a different face on it. It had about six knobs on it. And it was like a phase shifter slash chorus. And uh, I don't know what happened to that, but I I had uh, that that uh, poly chorus and this EQ, this was on my Rhodes. I had a Fender 73 Rhodes. And this box was on it. And then I used to use this to EQ the Rhodes off. And uh, I tested this. This this still works. It's not too bad. It's still kind of clean. And uh, so, um, and then another thing I had was I built this during the '80s, and uh, this was a microphone splitter. All right. And uh, this is modded in my rack, because I always had racks, all right? Uh, even when I was 12 years old, I played a four keyboard rig. I had a uh, Fender Rhodes, a fourth piece of organ, a Krumar, no, uh, an Elka string machine, and a Moog satellite, all right? And then I had a Leslie, then I had a cabinet, and uh, a bunch of stuff. But what this was, this was a microphone splitter, and you would plug this into your keyboard mixer, all right? And then you would come out of your microphone into this, then out of this into the PA. So what this box gave you, uh, this would en enable you to put your vocal mic through your keyboard speaker. So you'd have your own personal monitor. And uh, a couple of us did this. I, I, I believe I was the first in my area to do this. And... I came across another uh, keyboard player. Um, actually, it was pretty cool. Uh, a lot of people were telling me there's a keyboard player around, and they, he went by the name. They, his nickname was Fat Boy. And uh, uh, one friend of mine goes, "Man, you got to hear your competition," which was kind of funny because I never looked at other keyboard players as competition. But um, I went to go hear him play. And the guy sounded like me. He had the same style and everything. And then uh, we got to talk, and then I went up and I, I sat in on his equipment. And then I, he also sang, and I also noticed that he was doing the same thing I was doing. With the uh, he split, he he had a splitter on his uh, microphone, and he was playing through his cabinet and everything. And it was like, wow, the guy plays like me, sings. And he was doing a thing that went, I'm wondering if I have a lost brother <laughs> or something like that. But, um, you know, keyboards have come such a long way. And I really am a keyboard freak. I, because, you know, when I was young, I, I came from a strict Italian family. All right. 
I didn't have, uh, I had zero street smarts or anything like that. I, all I knew was music and everything. And uh, so I was basically like a music nerd. So like, um, all I did was keyboards, 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 keyboards. Well, um, a lot of my friends are out there getting laid and stuff. I don't think I got laid till I was like 16, maybe, I don't know. But, um, it was just always keyboards. But I always been like a fanatic over keyboard rigs and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of variation of rigs, but this is the rig I'm using now. And it's a highly capable rig. Um, and there's a couple things about it. Now, I can get ignorant, like, if I want to, you know, um, um, cause I, I had, you know, I could use a Cronus or a Triton. I have the original Phantom. Uh, uh, I got a bunch of other keyboards out in the cave. And, uh, but one of the things about this rig, it's light. All right. This is a uh, Corgi X61, and I think this is like 14, 15 pounds. This is a Corgi X73, this is like 15, 16 pounds. This is an 88 uh, Numa Compact 2X, it's 88 keys, it does organ, synthesizer strings, it does everything, all right? And this weighs 15 pounds, all right? Um, I got the uh, the Pro 800 by Behringer, which is, I call it the Prophet 8. This is very light, all right? I got the uh, the, the Rollin' Gaia um, synthesizer, polysynth, all right? This thing is probably about 12 pounds. It's not heavy at all. My, actually, my heaviest pieces are the, uh, the Mackie cabinet, which is right here. That's a 15 in the horn. That weighs 33 pounds, and then this is my rack. This has a 12-channel Mackie mixer in it, and uh, then it's also got my uh, Digitech Vocalist Live Pro for vocal harmonies, all right? And um, matter of fact, just unmute all this stuff in case I decide to play. But what's really cool about this rig is I don't need a vocal splitter because with the um, with the um, let's see, kill this. I got my vocals right into this, all right, and uh, so I can control the volume and take it down and bring it up or whatever, and. Um, so this this works like a vocal splitter, and uh, what's cool about the Digitech, I got four outs on it, and uh, so I have a, a left and right and quarter inch, and left and right and XLR. All right, um, so then what I did was I come out of the, uh, the left and right uh, low side, and I have a splitter which turns it into mono, and that has a jack on the back of the rack which goes the house. All right, then I come out left and right quarter inch, and I have a splitter on that that takes the left and right and brings that into a mono, mono send, which I send into my Mackie board right here. And then if I want to hear myself, I just bring the volume up, and there we go. I got my vocals. And uh, so that's really cool. So, uh, you know, another cool thing is also growing up, you know, my brother, uh, my brother Don, who was a, um, besides being an organ player, well, he started out, he, was, he played organ, drums, and he also played bass. So he was like one of the few of the DP Azos to like, uh, learn how to play a string instrument. And, uh, but uh, um, since I was such a uh, music nerd, my brother Dom always tried to get me involved in other stuff too. And so we would buy these Heath kits which are basically, they're electronic kits, and you can buy them, and they're, they're all in pieces, all right? So you put all the little components on the circuit board, and you solder them all in, and you can build an oscilloscope, or a bulletin meter, or a frequency modulator, and, or whatever. And so Donald got me into electronics, and all that stuff at an early age, and also carpentry and stuff, but, Used to build, we used to build all type of stuff. 
And uh, so by learning how to solder and everything and do wiring and stuff like that, uh, we even made our own cables. And for an example, I just made this cable yesterday. It's a brand new cable, all right? And then I even make my own, I even make my own sustain pedals. And uh, also, um, I make a lot of these, all right? And a lot of my friends uh, have these because I give these away as uh, presents to my close friends. And I call this a Leapatron, but what it is, it's a cable tester. Like, if you have a quarter-inch cable, you just plug it into here. And if it's good, you'll get two lights, all right? Alright, and as you can tell, both lights uh, light up, alright, and then, it's just got to pull it out there, and, or, and then also it does microphone cables, alright, or you can plug in the adapters, and you can test RCA cables, alright, and, uh, so, I mean, I got, I got to build a lot of things like that, but, um, getting back to the keyboard rigs and stuff, um, I really dig this rig because it's so light, lightweight, and basically these these Chrome EX keyboards, they're little Tritons and they're little Chronuses, you know, and I can do everything I need these keyboards to do, like if I need a flute, um, let's see. So I got my flutes, or if I need a brass section or whatever, I have it. Then I also use uh, this keyboard. All right, so I got all I got all that stuff happening and stuff. And but um, I could set everything up if I need a brass section. What's this? So I can get everything I need to get out of it. The only, the only thing that this system lacks is uh, um, uh, independent sampling, all right? Um, I these play samples, um, but um, you can only you're at the mercy of the library. All right, you can only play the samples that you have a library for. And uh, but uh, I was thinking about buying that new. Um, there's a Rollin Rock mount uh, unit, and uh, matter of fact, I I believe this unit even has a built-in mic. And you can just sample and then MIDI into it and all that stuff. Uh, that would be cool. But during the, uh, during the golden age, uh, during the 80s, you know, we were using the Mirage sampler and uh, the Emacs 2 sampler. And uh, Roman had the, what was it, the W30? That was a really cool sampler. And uh, we had all that stuff out. And uh, then back in the golden days, uh, we had the um, the mini moogs, and but this the guy that does all that. So it does all the mini moog sounds, but it's also poly. All right, like right now it's. Uh, I hit this button, now it's... You know, just by hitting that, I can just go back to the mono. And, uh, but it's really cool. And, uh, but you know, one of the greatest things about, uh, um, growing up through the 70s was the music. The music was just so good. 
and nothing like the crap that's out there today. And uh, gotta have my drink here. And uh, but there, yeah, there was so many good, so much good music out there. And you know, when I first started playing professionally, one of my first gigs was an oldies band. Now, back then the oldies were different, and uh, they, um, not to you what, what you would call oldies today, the oldies that I grew up playing were the 50s, and it wasn't hard to learn the, um, the oldies from the 50s because a lot of the songs, they just had the same progression, like, um, uh, They were called C, A minor, F, and G progressions, all right? Now, you're not always playing C. It depends upon what key you sing the song in, but that they were just C, A minor, F, and G. It's like, um, check one. Be like that. Just one, four, five, or, uh, C, F, and G. So it was like oh, a lot of pretty uh, easy stuff. And um, then occasionally you'll get get more songs with harder chords and stuff like that. And then when I hooked up with the Vogues, um, a lot of their stuff had a lot of chords in it, like um, My Special Angel, Turn Around, Look at Me, uh, You Were the One, Five O'Clock World. Uh, I think we had about six hits out. And, um, and also, what was crazy about when I went on the road with that band is they did songs in keys that I'd never really played in. So we're all playing in a lot of like, like C, D, E, F, G, A, you know, those are the mainly keys I played in. But when I got with the Vogues, I was doing stuff like an E flat, A flat. F sharp, and I don't care, uh, I don't know about you guys, but F sharp is one fucked up key to play in, man. Oh my God. And thank God I didn't have to play any leads in that key. And, uh, but uh, we did a, uh, one of the Vogue's hit was a song called No Not Much. And I, I, I don't know what I... Sharp. Well, I lost the days around you know not much. And that was one of the songs that like really messed up keys. But um, everything's a challenge, so but um, it was really, really cool, you know. And uh, then also back then was the days of the ham and organ. <laughs> and the Leslie's and all that stuff and uh, but it's just crazy, as you know, as I get older and uh, I have a tendency, uh, I'm not in good health, guys. Um, I got a, I got cerebral arthritis, so I can't play like I used to play. And, uh, and uh, so that stuff kind of uh, makes me feel bad, but I occasionally go out and still rock. And, uh, but um, it's just wild. You know, but you you look at all all the uh, all the stuff that uh, we've had since then, and but I see a lot of st uh, step backwards in keyboards. Like um, 
uh, back during the 80s, aftertouch was a big thing, all right? And like now with just uh, you know, you're lucky if you get a keyboard with aftertouch. And well, let's just look at it here. We have the Gaia, no aftertouch. And that's, that's a synthesizer, no aftertouch. We have two, uh, two uh, crumbs, no aftertouch. Uh, the Prophet 8, well, it's a module, but it, it does accept aftertouch. But you have to have an aftertouch keyboard. Luckily, the Studio Logic has aftertouch. A good example would be uh, only 4%. After touch. Thank God my fellow Italians decided to do that. Now another thing that this now this we're getting into the shit that pisses me off. Because a lot of these companies don't uh, they're not appealing to keyboard players. A good example I'm a big joy uh, joystick freak, alright? And uh, and a good example is like with joystick. You can't do that. Uh, let me kill some of the, uh, make this a little bit better. Now you, you, you could do that with the wheel. But, now this next riff you can't do on the wheel. Joysticks are so much better. But now, okay, Roland came out with the Gaia. All right, now they came out with the Gaia too. All right, one of the things that really make the Gaia really cool is having the joystick and the modulation stuff on it. Well, they did away with that. Now you got you're back to two wheels. All right. Now I think what would be the coolest thing to do is, you know, it's great to do like you have a wheel. Maybe you could do a. Have a wheel where you could sweep it. Then you can do other stuff with the other wheel. So maybe have two wheels and still have a joystick. That'll give you so much more control. And what the Gaia 2 has on it, it's got two wheels and a motion pad. All right. Now, what I like about the Cronus and the Triton, you have switch one, switch two. You have the, the four way joystick. All right. This here is three way. Uh, these are four way here. All right. Um, but you also get the ribbon control on it, all right? So, I mean, this stuff that I'm talking about should be standard on all your keyboards, all right? Uh, another thing that kind of pisses me off is um, lack of number pads. Now, the guy is not so bad because you have a registry. So, like, if say, if I wanted Steve Miller, all right, or Keith Emerson, 
or uh, or Bubba O'Reilly. Keith Emerson. Welcome back, my friend. So you can actually jump to like cars. <laughs> stuff that I'm talking about should be standard and it's just not I, mean, I just don't know why they don't give you you know thing uh, and um, a lot of scrolling to get to the sounds you want but this is why I like the crumbs because you know I could punch in a number and uh, and I can go horn section you know, um, if I want blitz. You know, I could, I, I, I could just punch in whatever I want. And uh, I know um, I got in the Sonic keyboard, it's the MR76, really fantastic keyboard, one of the best ones they made. And, uh, but, it's a pain in the ass. You got two knobs. You got one knob that gives you a category, and then the other knob is a scroll. So you take one knob, you go like, okay, I want electric pianos. So you have to scroll up to electric piano. Then I went, okay, I want suitcase roads. Now you gotta go over to the second knob and turn and go to suitcase roads. Well, before you actually get to your, you find the program you want, you're like uh, maybe 15, 20 seconds into just switching the program, which is a pain in the ass. And uh, so I, I just don't know why these uh, keyboard companies just don't cater to the keyboards. And it's just, I know a lot of my, well, all my close friends, were, we're all baby boomers. And, the, and most of my friends are keyboard players. And we all have the same bitches, you know. Um, now I know there's a lot of new stuff that everybody's using, like main stage or on song or all this computer stuff and then uh, of VSTs and uh, well, you know what, VS, VSTs could be cool, but you know what, I got a, I got laptops, I got uh, PC computers, uh, I can't get them to work. I, I, you know what I mean, I'm not... You know, I'm not exactly stupid when it comes to co computers, but I just can't get the VSTs to work. It's just, you know, you plug everything in and you try to dial up and it, there's always some sort of problem. And, uh, but I don't know, I, I kind of like what's simple and sweet. And that's why this is my rig for the, uh, for playing on. And, uh, you know, another thing that uh, kind of, um, a lot of these people are doing all these um, what a module so you got all these modules and cords everywhere and um, then they, you got all this shit plugged in to do a basic sound you know a, a sound that a lot of your 80, 80 keyboards will do so I mean yeah it looks good but I mean why well, have all that stuff I'd rather have a sound that I can just jump to, you know, and uh, so, I don't know, maybe I'm too old school or, or whatever, but, you know, it just seems like everything is just, uh, back in my day, we always had a rule, it was keep, keep it simple, stupid, and, uh, and what I do is I have I use like a departmental style of playing, so kind of, um, let's see here, um, and that, okay, um, 
So basically what I do is, here we go. So if I need piano, string. And then what I do over here, I'll set for organ. So rather than playing up here, I just make another octave down here so I'm not doing this crap. All right, so. All right, so that's, then Leslie, uh, everything's on the button. So I kind of keep everything. And another thing too is what I've been like, getting back to more electronic stuff. Um, well, on the, uh, the Studio Logic, they got your volume all the way up here. All right, why? And, um, I mean, if you're playing like... And uh, so why all that? And then you have to go like that. Well, what I did is I put an out pad here. So. And up we have a Rowdy. Um, um, what am I doing here? Let's see that. Um, Mr. Uh, Prophet 8 was talking to me. Also now, let's say if I wanted to do the uh, the Prophet Eight,
of crazy things here. And that's why I got these. You might even have a third pad, so if I want to... But I also have this on the volume, too, so... But with such a cell pad, my volume is really, really punchy like this. And uh, so the cell pad kind of tames that down. But right here at my fingertips, it's just like a, a little miniature mixer, you know. And But basically, I was just just jamming with just a Numa and uh, the, the Prophet 8. You know, I still have crazy shit I could do on these keyboards, which is, you know, which is really cool because... I mean, this is technology. Uh, can you imagine if we have all this shit back in the, the 70s, um, how cool music would be? And uh, so, but, I don't know. I, I find that the older I get, the more nostalgic I get. And, uh, you know, I, a lot of cool stuff back then. And, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff now, but I just... It seems like music is t being taken out of the hands of the musician and it's more where, you know, you basically hit a button and it, it does all the playing. Where, you know, back in my day, we had to play everything. You know, and another thing, like uh, I saw, I watch a lot of rigs on, um, a lot of videos on keyboard rigs, all right? And, um, you know, I see this guy, He's bringing, uh, he has a Clavinet D5 hooked up with a wall up pedal, a small stone face shifter, and some other uh, pedals. All right, so you got a keyboard and this basically does Clavinet sounds. So you have the pond room to put that up there. All right, so you got that and then you got all these um, extra pedals, all right? So usually you hook up all the power supplies for those, then all the audio cables, and uh, to give you that clavinet sound. Well, me, I just pull it up. I want on it. And it's just like everybody's doing all this. And I see a lot of these bands, they got all these pedals hooked up. And it's just like, why? It's just the more you do, the more complicated you make. One thing fails in that loop, and you're out of business, you know? So, I don't know. It's just a lot of this stuff don't make sense to me. You know what I mean? So, I hope you guys find what I got to say pretty interesting. Um, it's just back. You know, like, you know, when we first started playing, all we had was organ and piano. Uh, a string machine came along and the synthesizer. And then now look at all the toys we got. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's like, you know, they give you stuff like during the 80s, like the aftertouch, and they take it away. And then, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it's almost 2024, and I'm bitching about keyboards that still don't have out to touch on them. All right, like, really? You know? So it's like really stupid, I think. But I'm going to be coming out with more uh, videos. Uh... Well, you know, back, like in my cave, you got guys, you know, those of you who know me. You know, I, I got a whole shitload of keyboards in my cave, including my B3 and Leslie and all that stuff in there. But um, what I'm having fun with is, well, see, the live rig, uh, I, I just use it to play with. But workstation, workstation, all right? 
and these are all newer sample drum samples and everything but the thing is is I mainly play with these toys for when when I use in the band all right and then then I'll go and sequence or Cronus or Triton or whatever and uh, but um, now that I got all my live rigs set up in the garage I am now doing more playing with these where I'm kind of like jamming out and I'm starting to have more fun and uh, again, well here's something here I'll, I'll, I'll uh, turn you on this is something I wrote the other day uh, and, and you know the thing is is like uh, and I'm just kind of relearning these keyboards for sequencing which they're really a lot of fun to work with so um, okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to media and then find the song and there it is and load it and say okay and bam it's loaded so now, now this is uh, something I just started writing and uh, here we go oh I got the hit sequence <laughs> is like you know now I could play this stuff and then I could practice various finger exercises with this stuff and which is now due to all this really arthritis I got um, it's you kind of basically have to retrain your fingers uh, in a different way because certain ways you can't play it like that anymore and uh, so but I'm just having a blast with all this stuff and uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed the nostalgic look back and I hope you get some ideas and uh, also um, if you guys aren't on my Facebook group Keyboard Talk there's a link on um, uh, come on up and join and uh, if you guys uh, shoot me uh, a text um, if you guys need any special stuff made or if you'd like to have a Leapatron chord tester or um, check out my library I customize Leslie's I do all type of crazy stuff if you need to talk to me about stuff I would love to talk to you guys because I'm retired and uh, and this is basically all I do so I uh, hope to hear from you uh, God bless and I'm going to uh, drink some more coffee then I'm gonna try to play so okay guys God bless catch y'all later